power of the master mind. The driving force. The ninth step toward riches. Power is essential for success in the accumulation of money. Plans are inert and useless, without sufficient power to translate them into action. This chapter will describe the method by which an individual may attain and apply power. Power may be defined as organized and intelligently directed knowledge. Power, as the term is here used, refers to organized effort, sufficient to enable an individual to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Organized effort is produced through the coordination of effort of two or more people, who work toward a definite end, in a spirit of harmony. Power is required for the accumulation of money. Power is necessary for the retention of money after IT has been accumulated. Let us ascertain how power may be acquired. If power is organized knowledge, let us examine the sources of knowledge. A infinite intelligence. This source of knowledge may be contacted through the procedure described in another chapter, with the aid of creative imagination. B. Accumulated experience. The accumulated experience of man may be found in any well-equipped public library. An important part of this accumulated experience is taught in public schools and colleges, where it has been classified and organized. C. Experiment and research. In the field of science, and in practically every other walk of life, men are gathering, classifying, and organizing new facts daily. This is the source to which one must turn when knowledge is not available through accumulated experience. Here, too, the creative imagination must often be used. Knowledge may be acquired from any of the foregoing sources. It may be converted into power by organizing it into definite plans and by expressing those plans in terms of action. Examination of the three major sources of knowledge will readily disclose the difficulty an individual would have, if he depended upon his efforts alone. In assembling knowledge and expressing it through definite plans in terms of action, if his plans are comprehensive, and if they contemplate the large proportions, he must, generally, induce others to cooperate with him, before he can inject into them the necessary element of power. Gaining power through the master mind. The master mind may be defined as coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. No individual may have great power without availing himself of the master mind. In a preceding chapter, instructions were given for the creation of plans for the purpose of translating desire into its monetary equivalent. If you carry out these instructions with persistence and intelligence, and use discrimination in the selection of your mastermind group, your objective will have been halfway reached even before you begin to recognize it. So you may better understand the intangible potentialities of power available to you through a properly chosen mastermind group. We will here explain the two characteristics of the mastermind principle, one of which is economic in nature, and the other psychic. The economic feature is obvious. Economic advantages may be created by any person who surrounds himself with the advice, counsel, and personal cooperation of a group of men who are willing to lend him wholehearted aid. In a spirit of perfect harmony, 
This form of cooperative alliance has been the basis of nearly every great fortune. Your understanding of this great truth may definitely determine your financial status. The psychic phase of the mastermind principle is much more abstract, much more difficult to comprehend, because it is reference to the spiritual forces with which the human race, as a whole, is not well acquainted. You may catch a significant suggestion from this statement, no two minds ever come together without, thereby, creating a third, invisible, intangible force which may be likened to a third mind. Keep in mind the fact that there are only two known elements in the whole universe, energy and matter. It is a well-known fact that matter may be broken down into units of molecules, atoms, and electrons. There are units of matter which may be isolated, separated, and analyzed. Likewise, there are units of energy. The human mind is a form of energy, a part of it being spiritual in nature. When the minds of two people are coordinated in a spirit of harmony, the spiritual units of energy of each mind form an affinity, which constitutes the psychic phase of the master mind. The master mind principle, or rather the economic feature of it, was first called to my attention by Andrew Carnegie, over 25 years ago. Discovery of this principle was responsible for the choice of my life's work. Mr. Carnegie's mastermind group consisted of a staff of approximately 50 men, with whom he surrounded himself, for the definite purpose of manufacturing and marketing steel. He attributed his entire fortune to the power he accumulated through this mastermind. Analyze the record of any man who has accumulated a great fortune, and many of those who have accumulated modest fortunes, and you will find that they have either consciously or unconsciously employed the mastermind principle. Great power can be accumulated through no other principle. Energy is nature's universal set of building blocks out of which she constructs every material thing in the universe, including man, and every form of animal and vegetable life. Through a process which only nature completely understands, she translates energy into matter. Nature's building blocks are available to man, in the energy involved in thinking. Man's brain may be compared to an electric battery, it absorbs energy from the ether, which permeates every atom of matter, and fills the entire universe. It is a well-known fact that a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. It is also a well-known fact that an individual battery will provide energy in proportion to the number and capacity of the cells it contains. The brain functions in a similar fashion. This accounts for the fact that some brains are more efficient than others, and leads to this significant statement, a group of brains coordinated in a spirit of harmony, will provide more thought energy than a single brain, just as a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. Through this metaphor it becomes immediately obvious that the mastermind principle holds the secret and the power wielded by men who surround themselves with other men of brains. There follows, now, another statement which will lead still nearer to an understanding of the psychic phase of the mastermind principle. When a group of individual brains are coordinated and function in harmony, the increased energy created through that alliance becomes available to every individual brain in the group. It is a well-known fact that Henry Ford began his business career under the handicap of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance. 
It is an equally well-known fact that, within the inconceivably short period of ten years, Mr. Ford mastered these three handicaps. And that within twenty-five years he made himself one of the richest men in America. Connect with this fact, the additional knowledge that Mr. Ford's most rapid strides became noticeable, from the time he became a personal friend of Thomas A. Edson. And you will begin to understand what the influence of one mind upon another can accomplish. Go a step farther, and consider the fact that Mr. Ford's most outstanding achievements began from the time that he formed the acquaintances of Harvey Firestone, John Burroughs, and Luther Burbank. And you will have further evidence that power may be produced through friendly alliance of minds. There is little if any doubt that Henry Ford is one of the best informed men in the business and industrial world. The question of his wealth needs no discussion. Analyze Mr. Ford's intimate personal friends, some of whom have already been mentioned, and you will be prepared to understand the following statement. Men take on the nature and the habits and the power of thought of those with whom they associate in a spirit of sympathy and harmony. Henry Ford with poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance by allying himself with great minds, whose vibrations of thought he absorbed into his own mind. Through his association with Edson, Burbank, Burroughs, and Firestone, Mr. Ford added to his own brain power, the sum and substance of the intelligence, experience, knowledge, and spiritual forces of these four men. Moreover, he appropriated, and made use of the mastermind principle through the methods of procedure described in this book. This principle is available to you. We have already mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. Perhaps the majority of those who have heard of Gandhi, look upon him as merely an eccentric little man, who goes around without formal wearing apparel, and makes trouble for the British government. In reality, Gandhi is not eccentric, but he is the most powerful man now living. Moreover, he is probably the most powerful man who has ever lived. His power is passive, but it is real. Let us study the method by which he attained his stupendous power. It may be explained in a few words. He came by power through inducing over 200 million people to coordinate, with mind and body, in a spirit of harmony, for a definite purpose. In brief, Gandhi has accomplished a miracle, for it is a miracle when 200 million people can be induced, not forced, to cooperate in a spirit of harmony, for a limitless time. If you doubt that this is a miracle, try to induce any two people to cooperate in a spirit of harmony for any length of time. Every man who manages a business knows what a difficult matter it is to get employees to work together in a spirit even remotely resembling the harmony. The list of the chief sources from which power may be attained is, as you have seen, headed by infinite intelligence. When two or more people coordinate in a spirit of harmony, and work toward a definite objective, they place themselves in position, through that alliance, to absorb power directly from the great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence. This is the greatest of all sources of power. It is the source to which the genius turns. It is the source to which every great leader turns. The other two major sources from which the knowledge, necessary for the accumulation of power, may be obtained are no more reliable than the five senses of man. The senses are not always reliable. Infinite intelligence does not err. 
in subsequent chapters, the methods by which infinite intelligence may be most readily contacted will be adequately described. This is not a course on religion. No fundamental principle described in this book should be interpreted as being intended to interfere either directly, or indirectly, with any man's religious habits. This book has been confined, exclusively, to instructing the reader how to transmute the definite purpose of desire for money, into its monetary equivalent. Read, think, and meditate as you read. Soon, the entire subject will unfold, and you will see it in perspective. You are now seeing the detail of the individual chapters. Money is as shy and elusive as the old time maiden. It must be wooed and won by methods not unlike those used by a determined lover, in pursuit of the girl of his choice. And, coincidental as it is, the power used in the wooing of money is not greatly different from that used in wooing a maiden. That power, when successfully used in the pursuit of money must be mixed with faith. It must be mixed with desire. It must be mixed with persistence. It must be applied through a plan, and that plan must be set into action. When money comes in quantities known as the big money, it flows to the one who accumulates it, as easily as water flows downhill. There exists a great unseen stream of power, which may be compared to a river. Except that one side flows in one direction, carrying all who get into that side of the stream, onward and upward to wealth, and the other side flows in the opposite direction, carrying all who are unfortunate enough to get into it, downward to misery and poverty. Every man who has accumulated a great fortune, has recognized the existence of this stream of life. It consists of one's thinking process. The positive emotions of thought form the side of the stream which carries one to fortune. The negative emotions form the side which carries one down to poverty. This carries a thought of stupendous importance to the person who is following this book with the object of accumulating a fortune. If you are in the side of the stream of power which leads to poverty, this may serve as an oar, by which you may propel yourself over into the other side of the stream. It can serve you only through application and use. Merely reading, and passing judgment on it, either one way or another, will in no way benefit you. Some people undergo the experience of alternating between the positive and negative sides of the stream, being at times on the positive side, and at times on the negative side. The Wall Street crash of single quote 29 swept millions of people from the positive to the negative side of the stream. These millions are struggling, some of them in desperation and fear, to get back to the positive side of the stream. This book was written especially for those millions. Poverty and riches often change places. The crash taught the world this truth, although the world will not long remember the lesson. Poverty may, and generally does, voluntarily take the place of riches. When riches take the place of poverty, the change is usually brought about through well-conceived and carefully executed plans. Poverty needs no plan. It needs no one to aid it, because it is bold and ruthless. Riches are shy and timid. They have to be attracted. Anybody can wish for riches, and most people do. But only a few know that a definite plan, plus a burning desire for wealth, are the only dependable means of accumulating wealth.